called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him, and two other with him, one either side, one, and Jesus in the midst. Let's all stand together. I appreciate Brother Gerald and the ladies. I had put in a request for that song this evening because that is a major part of the message tonight. Without the cross, where would we be? I want you to open your Bibles to a very familiar passage, John 
chapter 3. And obviously we're going to be going to verse number 16 um, as we read. But I want us to begin in John chapter 3. And I want to read a rather lengthy passage this afternoon that I believe will lead us into the message that I have simply entitled, Without the Cross. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse number 1, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every man, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now read that long passage, because I believe that it is more than just important that we understand that before there could ever be a resurrection, that day that we all look forward to celebrating every year and we sing those triumphant hymns, but without the cross, without the crucifixion, there would be no resurrection. Without the crucifixion, there would be no salvation for you and I. And I believe there's a great false doctrine running wild in our land and in many churches that talks about the resurrection but ignores the crucifixion. It's easy to invite someone into the kingdom of God by telling them of the resurrection power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and we leave out the crucifixion. And I believe that there is an underlying motive for that. I want to share that with you this evening in the message without the cross. Father, we are grateful to you and we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the joy that you put in our hearts because we can be called the children of the Most High God. God, help us that we never, never compromise the standard of the Word of God as we, as we present the plan of salvation to a lost world. Now, Lord, we love you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. You can be seated. As Pastor Clay and I talked this week, and knowing that he was going to preach on the resurrection next Sunday morning, I thought it only fitting that we talk about the crucifixion this evening. Do you know that a number of years ago, I stopped by 
the Baptist bookstore in Muskogee. Back then, I, I think it still is directly across from the hospital there. And I stopped by there one day actually to talk to the director of missions. And as most of you know, in those offices, they actually have bookstores and you can buy all kind of Christian things and such as that. As I walked by the counter there by the cash register, I noticed that there was a little box there <clears throat> and it was filled with crosses. Just about every kind of cross you could imagine. They had crosses carved out of wood. They had crosses made out of leather. They had crosses that looked like somebody had knitted them. There were all kind of crosses. That's not necessarily what caught my attention. What caught my attention was the sign that was in the box that said crosses half price. Crosses half price. And when I saw that, it kind of sent chills up and down my spine because I thought that's what's wrong in America today. We have cheapened the cross of Christ. We have cheapened the doctrine of the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have abandoned the standard of the Word of God when it comes to presenting the true gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm grateful for the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Did you know that because of the cross, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, where is thy sting, O grave, where is thy victory? Because of the cross, there is no sting in death, and there is no victory in the grave. We got a call last night about midnight that one of our dear brothers in Christ who used to live here and is still a member of our church and he went on to be with the Lord last night about midnight. Miss Deb got a text from Brother Bob Bale's son who has been helping take care of him. But Brother Bob got to live in his own little residence there and on the property and, and he got to live a, a good Christian life and many of you remember Bob and you could talk to him about spiritual things and and tears would begin to flow down his face because he got saved later in life and he realized what the cross meant to him he realized that Jesus died on the cross to forgive him and redeem him and realizing that he had lived a life on the other side and yet God's love was so great for him that Jesus went to the cross for him and as Miss Deb took the call this morning and, and uh, we laid there and, and talked about it, I've just got to tell you, I had a hard time being sad about that. You know why? Because he was 93 years of age. He was ready to go be with his beloved wife who had gone on before him. And the Bible says there is no sting in death and there is no victory in the grave. They will lay him to rest in a few days. That's his body. But the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And without the cross, we could not say that. The Bible makes much of the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior there's a real good possibility that next Sunday morning we will come together and sing, Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. And we'll sing that with great anticipation, looking at the resurrection of our Savior, but without the resurrection, without the crucifixion, there could be no resurrection. I love that old hymn that says, Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future, life is worth the living because he lives. And yet, that resurrected Savior, that one who lives, lives because of the, of the crucifixion and the cross. Without the cross, where would we be? I believe that every true believer should rejoice over the great resurrection morning. But let us not overlook what happened just a few days before the resurrection. That awful crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I say awful in its nature, but triumphant for you and I. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. At this point, I would back up to something that I said earlier. It seems that modern 
day evangelism has led many people astray because we ignore the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior. And let me just expound on that for a moment, if I may. I was visiting with some of our men the other day, and, and I know that our church sometimes get criticized about various things. And I actually, I've grown to uh, appreciate some of the criticism that comes our way because generally what people say, that church just believes that whatever the Bible says, that's the way it is, and that's the way it is. And, and, and you know what? Whatever the Bible says, that's the way it is. Amen. And so I believe that would be a fair uh, description of what we are. Now, they always want to add to that that we are intolerant and we really don't love people and all of that. But all of you know different than that. It is because of the Word of God. It is because that we would preach the whole counsel of the Word of God, that we are admonished and encouraged and commanded to love one another as Christ loves us. You see, there's that false doctrine going around today that basically says that we can just stop one day and have this mental, uh, uh, I guess, assent that I'd rather go to heaven than go to hell, and we can just say a little prayer and invite Jesus to come into our heart, and we're heaven-bound. Let me just say this. If that was the way the gospel was presented to you, somebody left out some major parts of the gospel message. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, the cross of Calvary. You might say, how does that fit together? On the cross, Jesus paid the penalty for that sin. Remember, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And on the cross, Jesus paid our penalty for our sin. The Bible says in Philippians 3.10 that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Now, we'll get to a little bit more of that in a moment. What does that mean? It means that in salvation that we have to pass through death into eternal life. We cannot say that we have eternal life unless we have died to ourselves. Being born again means that somebody had to die. We have to die to ourselves in order to be born again into the kingdom of God. Now I want you to go to Romans chapter 6 with me. And I just want to read a few verses to you there that, once again, many of you will be familiar with. Now, I just want you to remember the main, uh, the main theme of what I'm saying to you this evening is that without the crucifixion, without that cruel and, and almost unimaginable event, there would be no resurrection morning for us to celebrate next Sunday. And so please keep that in mind in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 1. The Bible says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we, I want you all to help me with a few words here. How shall we that are, what, dead to sin live any longer therein? Make sure you don't miss the word dead to sin. If somebody's dead, that means they had to die. Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, and yet so many times we leave that out of our presentation of the gospel. The Bible says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his, what? Death. The death of the cross of Calvary. The Bible says, therefore, we are buried with him. Now, folks, I want to tell you that if you bury somebody, that means that they have died. And the Bible says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Have you noticed how many times in just those few verses that the Bible talks about death and dead and tries to help us understand that there had to be a crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? And in order for me to be saved, 
things. I have to identify not only with his life, but with his death. I must be willing to die to myself and be born again into the kingdom of God. The Bible says... For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, I don't want to stop and preach every verse, but if you look at verse number 5, it seems to imply, as a matter of fact, it does imply here, he says, for if we, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also uh, we, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. That means that you cannot separate the two. We have to identify with him in death, and then we will identify him in the resurrection, but you cannot separate the two of those. The Bible goes on and says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Now some of you are going, wait a minute, preacher, I thought being saved was all about life. I thought it was all about that new life. And, and folks, it is but is not to the exclusion of the understanding that there must be death before there can be life. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Two more verses. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. I would encourage you in your quiet time to read Romans chapter 6 in its entirety. And it will help you to understand that it is spiritually impossible to separate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior from that, listen, that glorious and yet in the eyes of the world, in, in the eyes of many, that horrible day, that horrible event where Jesus shed his blood on Calvary's cross for you and I. And yet it is just as glorious as is the morning of the resurrection. The Bible says that we cannot separate them. But we have lowered the standard of the word of God. And so that begs the question, why? Why do so many who profess Christ refuse to live for him? Why do so many that say they're saved seem not to be compelled, if you will, to live the life that he has called us to live when we profess that we are children of God? I can't answer for everyone, but I believe that one of the reasons is because the flesh has never died. The flesh has never died. The flesh still reigns in the life of many people who profess to be a child of God. For the last little bit, I've been very careful when I present the gospel. As a matter of fact, just this last week, I had numerous opportunities to share Christ with people. And I've come to realize that it's so easy just to ask somebody, would you like to go to heaven when you die? That is so easy to ask people. I mean, what a wonderful question to ask people. It's like asking a person who hadn't had anything to eat for three months, wouldn't you like to have a big steak and, and a big glass of iced tea? And I mean, the answer would surely be, sure, I'd love to have that. It's easy to ask the question. But I've been really reminded of late that when somebody gives me the opportunity to share Christ with them, that one of the first things that we need to do is explain to people, you are a sinner we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of that, let me take you to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there at the cross where my Savior died, there wherefore cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. And you share the true gospel. You share that gospel that says the reason that people come, the reason the Holy Spirit draws you is because you are a sinner. And as one great preacher put it in the title of a message, we are sinners in the hands of an angry God. Oh, preacher, don't talk to me about an angry God. Tell me how much God loves me. I can do that when we get to the cross of Calvary. But we are sinners in the hands of an angry God. And yet God, the Bible says, but God... But God loved us so much, and that while we were yet sinners, he yet died for us. 
I've been reminded as I share Christ with people that we must not leave out the very fact of the very reason why there is a cross. You see, we paid a debt that we could not pay. And yet he paid the price for you and I on the cross. And so then once a year we come together and celebrate that great getting up morning when Jesus rose from the grave. But had there not been the crucifixion, there could not have been a resurrection. And if you have not come to understand that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin, if you've never had that explained to you, maybe someone that really loved you, maybe some preacher even might have just, you, you, you walked down the aisle and maybe even with tears in your eyes, you said, I want to be saved. And in our, the great joy of that, we do not share the truth. We just say, well, just say a little prayer and welcome to the kingdom of God. Folks, there's nothing wrong with little prayers. And there's nothing wrong with inviting people into the kingdom of God. But even with your invitation, they cannot enter unless we stick to the standard of the word of God. We have to stick to the word of God. And the Bible says, except you what? Repent. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Why do we repent? Because we are sinners. Why did Christ go to the cross? John said it this way, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The Bible is very clear, and yet in our culture today, we are so, in, we, we want people to be saved, and praise God, I do too. But I do not want people to stand before God one day and plead their case and say, Lord, I did this, and I did that, and I volunteered for this, and I volunteered for that, only to hear him say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. I don't want anybody to come through the doors of this church and think that you're saved, and yet hear the Lord say, depart from me. We are sinners, and we need a Savior. And Jesus Christ fulfilled that on the cross of Calvary, as he was crucified for you and for me. The Apostle Paul put it well in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. In the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How many of us can honestly say I've been crucified with Christ? I have joined him in his sufferings. I have become conformable to his death. The Bible makes it very, very cl clear. I think about people that come under conviction, and I praise God for that, but that conviction comes only from the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. The Bible teaches us that. The Bible says faith come by hearing, and what? Hearing by the Word of God. Well, I'll tell you what, Pastor Clay's message this morning, some of you might not think your, your, your senior pastor ever gets convicted. Well, I got convicted this morning. You know what I got to thinking? I got to thinking that donkey that was tied beside the road there in Jerusalem did his job better than I'm doing mine. That little old donkey, that little old donkey carried Jesus without a stumble he carried Jesus without any, without any problem at all. That was his call, and yet my call is to carry Jesus. My call is to carry that blessed word of God, and oftentimes I make excuses. Oftentimes I'm too busy. Oftentimes I've got other things on my mind, and I got to thinking, am I, am I not better than the, the little donkey that was tied there beside the road in Jerusalem? Oh, listen. It's an important thing, the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As I think about that the more and more, we realize that the Bible says, and oh, I could, just, I could just preach this over and over to you, and I would encourage you that in the Gospels, you will there see the account of the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior. And I would encourage you to read Matthew and the Gospel of John. Because what you will find there will literally bring you to tears when you see 
what your Lord and Savior went through so that you might have eternal life. I love that old hymn that we often sing. Matter of fact, I believe we did it this morning. There's a verse that says, My sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Nailed to what? Nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Some of you are smiling and saying, Are you preaching the hymn book tonight? How many of y'all have noticed in a lot of those old hymns? Now, I'm not saying that they're inspired of God, but I'm going to tell you they're inspired of the Scripture. My sin, not in part. You know what that means? That means that God didn't miss a single one. Not in part, but the whole was nailed to the cross in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The crucifixion. Oh, where would we be without the cross? And so this dangerous and, I believe, eternally damning doctrine that's running wild through our world that says that one can be raised into the newness of life without experiencing death is a false doctrine. It's not altogether true. And if you're not altogether saved, then you're altogether lost. You can't get into heaven if you're almost saved. Do you remember what King Agrippa said to Paul in the last part of the book of Acts as Paul shared the gospel with him? He said to Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Do you know how close to heaven almost got King Agrippa? Not one step closer than the vilest sinner that ever put a foot on this earth. Almost saved, but almost is not enough. So why did Jesus have to die? I had a young person ask me that a few years ago, and I was just sharing the gospel with him, and he just looked at me. He had been helping me a little bit on the ranch, and we were in the vehicle together. And one day he just looked at me. We were talking about Scripture, and he said, he said, why did Jesus have to die? It made me know that I had not explained the gospel clearly enough to him. And that question is stuck in my mind. Many people don't have the courage to ask that question. Why did Jesus have to die? I want to expound upon that just a few more minutes this evening, if I may. Did you know that Jesus' death on the cross was absolutely essential to God's salvation plan? John 3, 14, the Bible says that the Son of Man must be lifted up. You might say, what does that mean? Well, it's a reference to the Old Testament that Pastor Clay preached on just a couple of months ago. Where the serpent in the wilderness would bite the people of Israel. And it was a death sentence. And God instructed Moses to, to make this, this stick, if you will. And on that was a brazen serpent. And the Bible says that if, if the if the, uh, the people were bitten by the serpent, by the snake, that if they would literally look up to that brass serpent and basically it was an act of faith that they would be healed, that they would not die. Did you know that it is absolutely essential for you and I that we look to the cross of Calvary, that we look to the cross and that we accept what Jesus Christ has done for us on that cross. That we understand what it means when the Bible says that in his being nailed to the cross, that he took the penalty for our sin. I used to wonder why did, did he say, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? It's because God could not look upon the sin that Jesus took upon himself. We need to understand that the crucifixion of Christ is a reality, and that it is an essential part of our salvation. Did you know that he died on the cross? Because God's perfect justice requires a payment. Now I want you to think about that. God is perfect in his justice, 
in his judgment. He is perfect. And for sin, there had to be a payment. There had to be, I'll touch it in a moment, a substitute. I remember some time back, I don't remember the occasion now, many years ago I preached on what the Bible calls a scapegoat. I've always kind of smiled as I've read that story about the scapegoat. We've all heard that term, but that's a biblical term. You remember how that worked? A certain time of year, because the offering of sacrifices for sin was so prevalent during that day, and yet I believe in the heart of hearts they knew that it wasn't sufficient, but nonetheless, there was a certain time of year that they would take a goat, and all the people would come into town, if you will, and they would symbolically lay all of their sins on that goat. And then one of the priests would take the goat out into the wilderness and turn the goat loose. He would be called a scapegoat because he would carry the sins away. And he was called a scapegoat. When I read that story, something really hit me. How many of you have ever owned a goat? If you feed a goat, you can't run that sucker off. I mean, you can load him in your truck and haul him away, and he will find his way back home. And I think about the uselessness. I think about how ridiculous the very idea of a scapegoat, because when I read that story, a smile comes across my face, and I, this question hit me, what if the goat came home? He would carry all of your sins right back home. And that's why God provided us a perfect scapegoat. He provided us a perfect, let me rephrase that, a perfect lamb, the lamb of God that was slain for our sins from the very foundation of this world. And once he forgives our sin, the Bible says he puts them as far as the east is from the west to remember them against us no more. I don't have to look out my window every morning and wonder if the goat came home because Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, ascended to my Father in heaven, and there he will be until the God the Father says, go get my bride. And can I say this? I live today in great anticipation that my Lord Jesus Christ is about to hear those words. He's about to hear those words from God when he says, Go get my bride. This thing on earth is over. And we will all spend an eternity with him. Not just because he rose, but because he died on the cross of Calvary for you and I. Why did Jesus have to die? It was a part of his plan. Why did Jesus have to die? Because we needed a perfect Savior to satisfy God's perfect justice. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says in Genesis 2.17 that when Jesus, when God talked to Adam and Eve, he said, if you do this one thing, if you sin, you're surely going to die. And we know what happened. Why did Jesus die? We sing a song that says, Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Did you know that without the cross, without Jesus having died on that old rugged cross, we could never be justified? You're right there in Romans. Just back up to chapter 5. And let me read something to you there. In chapter 5, I want to read just about three verses to you. Actually, I'll read two. Look at verse number 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ, what? Died for us. Listen, no, no crucifixion, no resurrection, no death, no life. He died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood. Justified, made righteous, made as if we had not sinned by his what? By his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him. Without the cross, without the blood, where would we be? Why did Jesus die? Because forgiveness comes only through the blood. 
I love that old hymn that we sing. We often sing it out at the ranch on Monday evenings when we have all the kids around Pastor Clay will play his guitar, and we have to sing something familiar because we don't have songbooks out there. So we usually turn loose on those good old hymns, What Can Wash Away My Sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 1 with me. Let me show you something there. 1 Peter chapter 1. I noticed this morning that about 20 minutes before Clay finished his message, he said, now in closing. And so I want to just say now, as I near the end here, go to 1 Peter chapter 1. And let me show you something there. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, in verse number 18 and 19, For as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold. Do you know that that paints a picture of Christ, the incorruptible, the sinless Savior? We're not redeemed with corruptible things. No amount of money can purchase our redemption, only the blood. The Bible says, with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fa fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb, without blemish and without spot, we were redeemed. How? Well, we say through Jesus Christ. But how? Through his death. Through the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, through his death, he took my place. We read in 1 Peter 2.24 about the substitutionary death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He took my place. Do you know, I have a good time uh, with our grandchildren. We, we try to make things fun, and oftentimes if the kids uh, have a little spat between them. How many of you all have had children that oftentimes have a little spat between themselves? Or an all-out war, maybe. And I've noticed that once in a while I can walk up on a situation like that, and of course they know they're in trouble. And so once in a while I'll turn things around just to kind of see how they feel toward one another. And once in a while I'll say to one of the grandchildren, I'll say, do you think that your brother needs a spanking? Did you know that almost every time they'll say, no? And then I'll ask the other one, do you think that your brother needs a spanking? No. No, I don't, I don't think that they should have a spanking. I did that the other day. And little Isaac, I asked him, do you think Fireball needs a spanking? And he goes, no. And I said, Fireball, do you think Isaac needs a spanking? He said, probably. <laughs> what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There's nothing we can do except, listen, except understand that Jesus shed his blood as the atonement for my sin. He took my place on the cross of Calvary so that I might experience the resurrection. He took my place on Calvary. When I think about that substitutionary death, I, I just read something, actually. I, I went back and found where I read it because it, was, it really stirred my curiosity. I have a book. And it's called Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. And it's a very um, on target, if you will. It's somewhat of a commentary, maybe. And he quoted Napoleon. Now, some of you would say, well, who was Napoleon? I had to ask that, too. I was just curious about that. And Napoleon died in the, 1700, in the 1800s. But Napoleon, a great military leader, once said, Great military leaders have founded kingdoms by force. 
But Jesus Christ, by his substitutionary death, has established his kingdom by love. Military men do it by force, but our perfect Savior, our perfect sacrifice did it through his substitutionary death because of his great love for us. Why did Jesus have to die? So he could rightly say on the cross of Calvary, it is finished. So without the cross, where would we be? When I think about the crucifixion, I read not only the crucifixion, but the events that led up to it. And they're horrible, almost indescribable. But before I got there, I noticed not only the crucifixion itself, but the other things that Christ endured just to get there. Did you know that the Bible says that even on the Mount of Transfiguration, that Moses and Elijah, the topic of their conversation with Christ was his death. You can read that for yourself in Luke chapter 9. They talked of his death, of that death that he would die to redeem mankind. And then I just read in Revelation chapter 5, beginning with verse number 12, that there will be a time when literally the four and twenty elders and thousands of angels will sing a new song. And that new song will be about the crucifixion, the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The inhabitants of heaven will sing the praises of the crucifixion. A number of years ago, there was a movie made about the crucifixion of Christ. I never saw it. Not that I didn't need to see it. I just never saw it. Because I believe the biblical account understood properly is sufficient. Did you know that even before Jesus was nailed to the cross... And Brother Barry, I have to tell you, as you described some of that this morning, it just sent chills all over my body. As you so well described the nailing of our Lord to the cross, when you first started that, listen, I may be weak in my flesh, but as you started to explain that, my body literally jerked. And I looked around the sanctuary. And I believe that there are a number of people here that even talking about that, even trying to describe it in our terms, almost shocks us into reality. But did you know that before he got to the cross, the Bible says that they scourged the Lord Jesus. I cannot with words describe that to you. I would simply ask you that in your quiet time you may do a Bible study on the word scourged and what you will find. It was the literal ripping of the flesh from the body. The tearing away of one's flesh. Not only by an instrument that had long strips of leather with rock and, gra and glass embedded in it. But in the hand of a professional person that knew how to beat you until your flesh hung from your bones and yet you would still be alive. Without the cross, where would we be? The Bible says that as they led him to the cross that they planted a crown of thorns. And I mentioned this the other night, and I will repeat it once again. They didn't just walk over to Jesus and gently place that crown of thorns on his head. You do a word study, and it says that they literally ran up to him, and they crushed this crown of thorns down over his brow, and the blood began to pour. The Bible says they spit on Jesus. 
They literally spat on him. One of the most degrading things that one man can do to another. And there publicly, Jesus took that. Why? For you and me. And he knew where that was headed. He knew he was going to the cross. But on the way there, he suffered such great pain and humiliation. The Bible says they smote him with their hand. I believe that means that they literally would try to get close enough to him and and hit Jesus in the face. All of that just on the way to Calvary. Why? Because you and I were sinners. We owed a debt we could not pay. And we've heard it said, and he paid a debt that he did not owe so that you and I could be redeemed. You see, the cross of Calvary is so important. Without the cross, we wouldn't be able to sing songs like we sing here at Lindsay Chapel. We sing one that says, My sin, oh, the bliss of that glorious thought. And I I repeat this because it's so very important. My sin, what? Not in part, but in whole. Is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Did you know that without the cross, you and I couldn't be saved? You might say, wait a minute, you mean without the cross, we couldn't even be saved? Without the cross, you could not be saved. Without the crucifixion, we would not be freed from the penalty of our sin. Without the cross, we couldn't sing that song that says there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. I'm glad I can't sing or I'd break out in song right now. I love that song, Down at the Cross Where My Savior Died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. What blood? The blood of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that he shed for you and I on the cross of Calvary. Without the cross, where would I be? I want to ask Miss Kristen to go ahead and make your way to the piano. I know the hour is late. But how many of y'all know that Jesus is coming soon? You need to be ready. You need to be prepared for that glorious day when the trump of God shall sound, the dead in Christ will rise, and those who are alive and remain will be caught up to be with him in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Pastor Clay, if you and Brother Dennis will come, and Brother Chet will help you get ready. We're going to observe baptism again this evening. And with that said, would you all stand with me as Miss Kristen comes? And with your head bowed and your eyes closed, there are those three simple words that I would like for you to consider without the cross. Without the cross, 